on behalf of the Suffolk Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Welcome to the session four of our Black Health Series, Prostate Health 101. In recognition of Men's Health Month, Suffolk Alumni is dedicated to increasing awareness and educating the community on preventive measures regarding medical issues. We know that some individuals are reluctant to go to the doctor. Our goal is to encourage everyone to seek proper screening tests, regardless of how well they currently feel. Early detection with appropriate treatment save lives. Our amazing speaker will share a wealth of knowledge that you will need to share with your loved ones to ensure they have a better quality of life. So be sure to share and like this presentation you can help increase awareness about men's health issues. At this time, today's moderator will introduce our speaker, chapter member Regina McKinney. Greetings. Thank you for joining us for session four, Black Health Series, Prostate Health 101. It gives me the distinct honor, privilege and pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Charlie Hill. Mr. Hill retired as Executive Vice President, Human Resources of Landmark Media Enterprises after more than 40 years of progressive leadership and management experience. In June, 2002, Mr. Hill's wife lost her 17 month battle with lung cancer. And at that same time, he had prostate cancer. The period between June and December 2002 was disturbing for him. He realized that the medical community had various views and treatments regarding prostate cancer and the lack of a standard for all men. In December 2002, Mr. Hill underwent nerve sparing surgery to remove his prostate gland. Later, Mr. Hill co-founded the Hampton Roads Prostate Health Forum in 2007. It has been a 501c3 organization for over 13 years. Mr. Hill earned his MBA from Hampton University and a bachelor's degree in economics from Virginia State University. He has been a member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity for over 54 years, 100 Black Men of America Incorporated, and a life member of the NAACP. He is now married to Mrs. Golden Bethune Hill, and they have a blended family of children and grandchildren. In addition, Mr. Hill has received numerous other awards and recognition for his community service, citizenship, and his servant leader efforts. Mr. Hill has been co-founder of the Community Free Clinic of Newport News since 2010. He received the Citizen of the Year Awards from the Delhi Press and Alpha Alpha Chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated and the Presidential Awards from Virginia State University and Hampton University. We are also blessed to have Mr. Everett Browning and Mr. Lawrence Davis joining us today. They are living testaments that awareness and early detection of prostate cancer saves lives. They are here to provide information on prostate health. Without further ado, I present to you, Mr. Charlie Hill. You have the stage, Mr. Hill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. McKinney, alumni chapter for your interest your investment of resources us back to help reduce suffering and save lives impacted by prostate cancer. Those who are participating today will find that our talks often are designed to appeal to men and women, particularly women. And it is very important that we understand that our talks uh, are structured in such a way to provide a baseline for further reference. So we, we are excited about that. And I'm going to move forward and answer the question 
that that I'm more most often asked, you know, what is the prostate gland? Where is it? And it's simply it's the it's part of the male reproductive system uh, that makes the fluid for carries that for carrying sperm. Uh, prostate cancer is the abnormal growth of cells that the body does not need. Uh, and sometimes they can be benign as they grow into tumors or they can become malignant. And that's when we call them cancer. The greatest risk factors for prostate cancer, particularly as they relate to, to black men uh, and all men in general, but black men in particular, race, age and family history. They are clearly important if you wish to understand uh, prostate cancer and how it impacts. Certainly as a man grows older, uh, age becomes even more important. But the highest risk men, black men and some others whose fathers and whose, or, or a brother have been diagnosed with prostate cancer really is a source of great concern and which is why you will hear from us over and over that early detection makes a huge difference because it is important that those men at highest risk understand that they are in, in that risk zone and we want to be sure that they get the treatment, uh, the attention that they deserve. The incidence of prostate cancer in the United States varies. Uh, black men, as I've indicated before, are at the highest risk. Uh, the rates for white men and uh, Hispanic men uh, tend to fall less. Asian, Pacific Islander, and Native American men typically have the lowest risk. It's important also that we understand that having one first degree relative that is a brother or father with prostate cancer uh, increases the risk substantially. And we want to continue to emphasize that if your father or if a brother has prostate cancer, it raises the bar in terms of your, uh, your potential for having prostate cancer. One of the things that's exciting about today is that we have Mr. Everett Browning and Mr. Lawrence Davis both of whom had fathers who were diagnosed with prostate cancer. And they'll talk a little bit more about how important that is. Other factors such as diet, exercise, body weight, and exposure to some other forces, uh, it's, they're important, but I wanna, I wanna make a big point out of diet and nutrition, exercise and fitness. Uh, we have seen enough to, to believe that if we want to do one thing that could make a difference in pr 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 protecting a man uh, and his family from prostate cancer, uh, it might be the diet and exercise. Uh, we typically don't have the commitment as a, as a group of people for eating the right thing, right thing being defined as that which is healthier for the body uh, and exercising that which is defined as doing those things that represent uh, better health for the body. Uh, obesity is not good for the body. And one of the other points that I'd like to make is that those things that we call quote, soul food, end quote, that tend to be based on a, or include a lot of fat, high fat and salt. Uh, these simply are just not good for anyone uh, if they're in excess, but particularly not good for black men. And we need, we need to talk more about that to understand how much and how important that really is. And that's a controllable risk. These are the things that men and their families can, can manage. And that's why the ladies are so important. Typically, ladies are generally responsible for uh, the meals in a home. Uh, and therefore, if they're preparing meals, it's important that they understand that, that what uh, their loved ones eat, uh, both uh, fat and, and sodium 
and other items can in fact put their loved ones at greater risk. And certainly uh, eating a higher amount, a larger amount of vegetables um, is, is a good thing. And we need to say that over and over. What you should know, prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer. It's important that we, that we understand that. It is the most commonly diagnosed cancer and probably one of the least discussed cancers uh, beyond small cliques of, of dear friends. We need to have a brighter light on it. We need to talk about it more openly. And this is why we're excited about working with uh, the Suffolk uh, alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta because they've taken that giant step saying, you know, we want to put a bright light on this. Uh, there are lots of statistics running around uh, about what risk or what amount of risk is that uh, uh, is out there in terms of men. But we do know that in, during their lifetime, one in eight uh, men uh, will no doubt be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Some reports will say one in nine, uh, and it changes generally every year. Uh, 2020, it was one in nine. 2021 is now one in eight. But we want to remember that when it comes to black men, one in six. So if you line up six black men uh, in, and you line them up and you count out, one of those six is likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. So we have to do something about that. If caught early, and this is part of the good, the good news, if caught early, prostate cancer has a five-year survival rate of nearly 100%. And, and the, the gentleman that you will uh, hear from today, uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Browning, uh, evidence, they're proof that uh, when, because they were uh, diagnosed early, they're evidence that they will in fact uh, have a good run and have had a good run with prostate cancer. I was diagnosed in 2002. There's no question that I was diagnosed early enough to be successfully treated. On the flip side, uh, if prostate cancer is uh, diagnosed a, at a later stage, it doesn't look good. And that is one of the concerns that we have. 29% uh, uh, success rate if it's too late. And, and oftentimes it is, it is too late because early stage prostate cancer does not have any symptoms. And I need to say that again, early stage prostate cancer does not have any symptoms so that the man will not know necessarily that he has prostate cancer. So he could be living his life and thinking everything is okay until he starts having some symptoms and finds out that, oh, that's associated with prostate cancer, which should have been diagnosed earlier. And that is why we want to be clear uh, about early stage prostate cancer and why it's so important that men be diagnosed early. Some sometimes people ask, well, how early? Well, how early should this be done? We believe that a man should be diagnosed no later than age 40. And if he has a lot of high risk uh, or prostate cancer diagnosis in his family, it should even be earlier. So we typically will say at age 35, a man and his family should get real serious about learning about prostate cancer because there are new developments every day and you don't want to be left behind or miss something that may be good for you. So I'd like for you to remember these numbers. If you are a black man, then you should start learning about prostate cancer no later than age 35. And you should start having annual blood tests or PSA tests and digital rectal exams no later than age 40. I've mentioned the early stage piece, uh, and it's important that, that we understand for those men who've missed the opportunity that typically what happens in the later stage is you have urinary frequency and uh, slow urine, uh, urinary flow, painful urination, 
There are all kinds of items. I have sat with men who have uh, died uh, from prostate cancer, uh, and, and they were some of the most painful deaths that I've experienced because none of the drugs that were being given at this particular hospital could, could ease the pain for these men. And I, one said to me and his wife, you know, just do something to take me away. The pain is just too, too great. Uh, and, and I don't want to be here anymore. That's the what, that is what happens with a prostate cancer patient. And we need to avoid as many of those cases as we possibly can. Let me be very clear. Uh, you hear a lot about PSA tests and you hear a lot about uh, exams, uh, digital rectal exams. These particular tools don't, don't tell you if you have prostate cancer, don't tell the doctor. You need to have a, bi a biopsy and that is taking tissue from the prostate gland that indicates that uh, there are cancer cells in that gland. So please remember, a biopsy is needed to diagnose prostate cancer in spite of what uh, the PSA test may say, in spite of what uh, the digital rectal exam may say, the biopsy is, the, is the really the, the actionable uh, event in order to move forward. Now, you should still take seriously a high PSA number and should take seriously an abnormal digital rectal exam. And, and oftentimes they channel, uh, and in many cases, the person will in fact have prostate cancer, but I want you to just be comfortable with the idea that you need to have the biopsy to go forward uh, to that confirms that you have prostate cancer. There are lots of treatment options uh, available. And I can remember when I was diagnosed in 2002, several of these were not available. And during two th in 2002, basically photon radiation and surgery, uh, open surgery, I call it the male version of the C-section, uh, open surgery and photon radiation were basically uh, the most frequently used uh, treatment options. Now you can see brachytherapy, which is seed implantation, radioactive seed in the gland, cryotherapy, which is freezing the gland. Uh, all of these particular options uh, are available and going forward, there will still be more. And that is the reason why uh, a, a man and his family should check in to the prostate cancer uh, story often, at least once a year so that he and they can be aware of the new tools and new treatment options to uh, help in their particular situation. And putting a wrap on where we are now before we actually start talking about uh, specific situations, uh, if you don't remember anything else, please remember that see a doctor yearly, see a doctor who will give, give you a PSA test uh, and a digital rectal exam. If you have a doctor who, who does not give you a PSA test and a digital rectal exam, and you are otherwise of age and your circumstances would suggest that, then I would encourage you to get another doctor. And that's extremely important. If you have a doctor who says all you need is to have the PSA test, and we're not going to worry about the digital rectal exam, I would say get another doctor. If you are the person who's saying, well, I'll do the blood test, but I'm not going to do the DRE, then you have a problem. And you need to understand that you need to do both the PSA test and the digital rectal exam. Uh, another help as you go forward that another uh, point that would help you watch for a change in your PSA numbers, track them. Uh, it's very important that you know if it's remaining the same, if it's increasing or if it's decreasing, because if it's increasing, doctors will use the increase and the rate of increase to provide an indication 
that prostate cancer may be present. So uh, even if you don't have any other problems, if your PSA rate is increasing, uh, then it's worth taking a real good look at. And as previously said, a biopsy uh, should be done. And if one is recommended by your doctor because she or he has seen something or believes something is going on uh, with you, then you, you need to do that. Uh, very important. It's very important that you find out if your father or a brother has or had prostate cancer. Oftentimes these matters are not talked about in families, uh, but it's worth you probing and answer uh, and seeking answers to that question. You know, what did, what did daddy have or what did my brother die from? If you don't get an answer that's uh, accurate, then I would say to you, assume that one of them did so that you will be ahead of the game. If, if you assume that your father had prostate cancer, you know he died. If you, if you assume, then you can help yourself by uh, assuming that uh, you had prostate cancer or a brother had prostate cancer uh, and you should, uh, you should follow that game plan. And I'm only saying this now in case of not, if you don't really know what a father and what a brother had, uh, I know that in many families, people don't like to talk about the C word. Uh, and uh, I oftentimes hear that uh, uh, so-and-so died from bone cancer. Uh, and I said, well, which bone? And they said, we don't know. We just know it's bone, bone cancer. One of the things that I know, and you know now, that one of the places that prostate cancer metastasizes to or spreads to are the bones. So there are a lot of people walking around or believing that their loved ones had bone cancer and they may have had prostate cancer. And that's why we need to be aggressive about that. You need to share this information with family and friends and, and associates. Uh, it's extremely important that you share this information. And if you have any questions, uh, there are people available to you with the Hampton Roads Prostate Health Forum. Uh, give us a call. 757-827-0488. Uh, Again, I repeat, 757-827-0488. Give us a call and see, if, uh, and we'll see if we can help guide you to the appropriate uh, place for care. Knowledge, faith, and early detection matter most. Can't get beyond that. The knowledge part is what the Deltas are sponsoring right now. You know, the knowledge includes both awareness and education. Yeah, this is always important and it changes over time. So if you got all the knowledge you needed five years ago about prostate cancer, let me just tell you that you've missed out on a whole new world of, of knowledge so that you need to catch up so knowledge is extremely important. And as a minimum, you should uh, get updated uh, once a year. Faith, uh, uh, I think faith uh, takes care of itself in terms of uh, your understanding of the role of a higher power. Uh, I know that in my case, uh, uh, if it were not for my faith and my belief, it would, it would be very difficult because I have a second cancer. I have blood cancer, I have lymphoma. Uh, and those are two opposite kinds of cancers to be concerned about. And uh, my faith in, in uh, the greater power that, that's involved in my life allows me to, to provide what, whatever service I can for other men and their families. And early detection, as we indicated before, it, it matters most. So knowledge, faith, and early detection really do matter most. And it's extremely important also that you remember that early detection saves lives. Thank you for this moment uh, to chat. Uh, and uh, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce uh, Mr. Everett Browning uh, and Mr. Lawrence Davis, first Everett Browning uh, Everett Browning and I have uh, been working together uh, nearly from the beginning or the formal beginning of the Hampton Roads Prostate Health Forum. He has a story that is worth hearing over and over. 
and he's had some experiences that are worth sharing. So I'm, I'm going to ask him uh, to talk about those. But before he does, I'm going to introduce Mr. Lawrence Davis. Lawrence and I, I think we've been knowing each other almost forever. Uh, he has an equally interesting and challenging story. Uh, and he was around in the beginning uh, when we were just, uh, uh, just an organization. Uh, the things that I want to mention to both of you, no matter, and, and they have a tremendous resumes that uh, I can share with you, but what I want you to know is that these two men, along with uh, a few others, are, are prostate cancer warriors. Uh, the, the Hampton Roads Prostate Health Forum does not have any paid employees. We are all servants, and, and that's important. And the reason that we don't call ourselves volunteers, and I think you can relate to this, volunteers get tired and sometimes they quit on you, okay? That's, that's the real world. Volunteers get tired or they wanna do something different, they wanna move on. Servants, don't stop. They may get tired, they rest, and they keep on going. So I'm, I'm proud to, to bring to you two of our servants uh, and, and we uh, will do whatever we can when we get to the question and answer period. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Everett. Uh, I'm gonna hand the baton to you, sir. Hello, my name is Everett Browning. Everett, we don't see your picture, but we hit, we heard you. Uh, Mr. Hill, we can um, go ahead and go with Mr. Davis and we're um, Go back to Mr. Browning. Okay, let's do that. Uh, Lawrence, uh, since there's a problem uh, at, at, uh, with Everett's uh, picture and sound, Lawrence, are you ready to step in? Uh, you have, yes, I am. Okay, sure, yeah. well, you have it, sir. Let me see. I'm trying to get my, okay. My name is Lawrence Davis and hold on unable to start the video because the host has stopped it. Okay, all right. Now, now I see. My name is Lawrence Davis. A lot of people know me as, as the bell ringer in Southampton Road. You always hear me, yeah, I made it. Because I too am a warrior for prostate cancer. And uh, it hit me very heavy because my father died from prostate cancer. After my father, six months later, less than six months later, my brother had prostate cancer. And I was a warrior at the time then, speaking about prostate cancer and trying to influence people about prostate cancer, about knowledge and early detection and faith. And uh, then I found out I had it. And uh, like most men, my ego just went crazy. It was like, whoa, what, what am I going to do? Oh, man. You know, the big C word scared me to death. But then I thought about my friend, Charlie Hill, and said, you know, Charlie's a strong man, and he's taking it very well. And like he's always trained me through knowledge, faith, and in early detection. So I, in turn, decided I was going to do something about this. It was in 2014, October the 23rd. My birthday was October the 24th. <laughs> when Christmas came, I, it was over with, and I was ringing that bell. <laughs> I was telling the world because I had proton, and it took care of my cancer. It uh, left me with no erectile dysfunction. It left me with no incontinence. And I was so happy. 
I, even at the present moment now, I go to different places and speak to men, Indian reservations, different states and so forth. Like Charlie said, we do this on our own. It's, it's not a paid thing. And tell them about prostate cancer and educate them and so that they can make intelligent decisions. Because I often hear people talk about, well, you got to change your diet. I don't know about that. Well, do you really want to live? My question is, you have to change your lifestyle. And look at the first three letters of it. L-I-V, I want to live. D-I-E is diet, first three letters. And uh, I want to live. I've got grandchildren. I may have a great grandchild coming. Uh, and I want the world to know. And I want them to know their grandfather's health and their great grandfather's health so that they can look out for it. Fortunately, my youngest brother, Eugene, has not had it. I've been able to keep him uh, in check. Other people around the world that, uh, well, at least on the East Coast, all the way from Newark to Slidell, Louisiana, we've been doing our thing, trying to get people to understand that you can beat this. You can live and enjoy a good quality of life. At the present time now, in five months, I'll be 75 years old. <laughs> and it's a great thing. Uh, cancer free, moving forward, trying to change the world as I can on prostate cancer. Listen to what Charlie Hill has to say. Take it seriously. Cancer is serious business. Prostate cancer is a serious situation. I want you to be here long after me and then some. I plan to be here for 120 years at least. <laughs> I'm moving toward it. <laughs> you cannot beat early detection and knowledge. You have to have the knowledge. We guys, we have egos and uh, because that's just the way we're built. They have egos. But don't let your ego put you in the ground because you can make sure that your life can be extended and you do not have to leave this world behind prostate cancer. We've got something for you. As Mr. Hill has showed you, there's eight different ways in which they can treat your prostate cancer now. And they are doing other things too. I heard of a pill that they were trying to get taken care of. Okay. Uh, and I know we as men and our ego, we want to, oh, can I get it quick? Give me the pill. But it didn't happen overnight that you have what you have. My ego was like some of the other men. I'm sitting up late at night. Oh man, wondering, oh wow. And my, my lady says, come on, let's go to bed. Uh, uh, it's, you gotta get your sleep. And I'm waiting up for this prostate uh, advertisement about, oh, how are we gonna take care of your prostate without even going to see a doctor? Don't let your ego kill you. Go see a doctor. Always see a doctor to make sure what your ailment or your situation is, what it really is. I've met several men who, matter of fact, I met a young man in Washington, D.C. And fortunately, his wife was a Delta and he was a doctor. And they told him, don't worry, you're all right. But when that Delta got on the case <laughs> and, and got on his doctor, and got him another doctor. She found out he had prostate cancer and it was worse than they thought it was. And she, he got it taken care of and he's still living this day. And that's over five years ago. So I wanna thank the Deltas for what they do. And I wanna thank all women for what they do because without you, we can't make it. My ego can carry me to the grave, but you can make me live long. Thank you very much for your being here today. Always 
get your prostate checked. Make sure that you transfer the information about yourself and your health on to your children and your children's children. I go to presentations of family gatherings, talk to people, Indian reservations, talk to them about that. Uh, and even in my own family, we have a uh, yearly meeting and we talk about that because we want to be here to do what we have to do in this world to make it a better place to stay. You can't make this world a better place if you're not here because the best is yet to come. <laughs> if you don't believe that, get your prostate checked. Look in the mirror and tell me what you see. As I say, the best is yet to come. Thank you so much for listening to me. I can go on forever telling you how grateful I am for the Hampton Roads Prostate Forum and uh, the Hampton University Prostate Health Therapy. I can tell you for all day long how great I am about that. But I tell you one thing, my father died from it. And my father, this is a picture of him himself. And he didn't have to die. This is a picture of my friend Charlie when I received my award-winning situation that I have no cancer anymore. And this is a picture over here in the corner, if you can see it, of Lou Alcindor, who I spoke to about prostate cancer in South Africa. I'm trying to do all I can, and then some, because like most men, especially black men, I'm greedy. <laughs> and through my greed, I've, it's more than each one reach one. I want to reach a whole lot. Because when I go to my creator, I want to tell my creator, if you can give me one blink of an eye, I got a posse coming. And they're all prostate cancer free. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. And uh, I don't know, is, is Edward back up? Uh, oh yeah, I'm up and ready. Okay, let's go, sir. Hello, everybody. My name is Everett Browning. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer back in 2008. But my awareness of prostate cancer really goes back to 2005. Now, I remember that I think I was in my late 20s, early 30s when my uh, father was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I remember carrying him to the doctor during his visit. I know he was getting some type of radioactive shots in his stomach. And um, maybe after a couple of months, it all cleared up. And, um, and my father was cured. And, you know, and back then, you know, I knew Pop had prostate cancer, but the family didn't say much about it. You know, uh, he survived it. And I really put it out my mind. I think, but back in maybe 2005, a friend of mine at work shared with me that he had just had prostate cancer surgery. And then he said he was curious about what was going on when he was diagnosed. So he bought a book and he said, now that he's passed everything, he's doing well, he shared the book with me. And I read about prostate cancer. And the first thing I, that came to note was I was in the high risk group because my father had, had tested positive for prostate cancer. Wow, boom, then the alarms went out in my head. I have two older brothers. So I immediately talked to them to say, listen, dad got it, I got it, and I'm pretty sure it's coming your way. Are you seeing your doctor? You need to see your doctor at least once a year and monitor your PSA level. I told them since I had became aware of prostate cancer that I was having my doctor uh, specifically run my PSA, um, run, doing my blood testing to check for my PSA levels to see what they were. And at home, I was plotting a, a level chart. And this went on from 2005 to 2008, when there was an increase in the velocity of the numbers. They started shooting up. And then I, my doctor recommended a biopsy. And that came back positive for prostate cancer. A month or so later, 
I had robotic surgery and my prostate was removed. And, and when I have my blood test now, my PSA rate is less than 0 0.01. But that's not the end of my story because I'm a survivor since 2008. I also um, have a son and I have grandsons. So for me, I'm still, I still have action to make sure that they are aware of prostate cancer and anyone else, friends, family, and relatives that I come in contact with. Um, a couple of years after 2008, one brother had it and the following year, the second brother was tested positive for prostate cancer. And I'm fortunate to say both of them caught it in time. They had their surgeries and were treated and they're doing well today. I have a son that's in his mid forties now, but before when he was around 40 a little earlier, I told him to make his doctor aware of his family history of prostate cancer and that he needed to start having his PSA monitor when he's had blood work. Now, my, I also talked to my nephews to tell them, if your dad had prostate cancer, you need to be aware of it. So if it comes your way, you're prepared for it. Keep, awareness is key to all of those things Mr. Hill talked about, the early signs of prostate cancer. You have to know what's your family history. You have to see your doctor. You need to monitor your PSA level. And then you need to take action when you see an increase in your PSA number. An increase doesn't always mean that you have, you're going to test positive for prostate cancer, but it's a good indication that something needs to be checked out. So awareness gives you that knowledge and so hopefully gives you that drive and that action to go out there and find out what's going on with your body. And also awareness to me also gives you an obligation to share this information with your family, friends, and associates. Tell your siblings, tell your, your, your greater family members, tell your, your coworkers, tell your friends. Don't sit and have knowledge about prostate cancer and don't share it because awareness can lead to early detection. It gives you more option for a positive op outcome with your medical situation with your doctor. And by all means, men, you need to be seeing a doctor at least once a year and getting lab work. It's no, it's, it's no getting around it. In college of your age, you need to get out there and see your doctor at least once a year and get lab work. A lot of us have medical insurance and still won't, won't go see a doctor. And there's no excuse for that. Go see your doctor so you know what's going on. And then that age old thing, well, I'll see my doctor when I start to hurt. Okay, prostate cancer doesn't have any symptoms. And when you start to hurt, chances are it's going to be way too late. Instead of making uh, arrangements for surgery and treatment, you might be making funeral arrangements. Think about it. So please see your doctor, get regular checkups, get your blood monitor, track your PSA levels, talk to your family members, find out your family history. If your father or brother had prostate cancer, you need to be on the lookout for it. You need to share this information with your primary care physician. And you need to tell your other friends, relatives, and loved ones what's going on. If you know what's going on, tell someone. Awareness is the biggest key to having people go out and be on the lookout for early detection of prostate cancer. Thank you for the time. Have a great day. Thank you, Everett. And, and I think now we, we should entertain some questions if they are uh, available to us. Yes, sir. We're going to go ahead and open the question portion. Good afternoon. My name is Shay Skinner, committee chair for the Suffolk Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I did also want to thank you both for sharing your personal experiences and being warriors for the cause. We are going to go ahead and open the um, venue now for questions. Give me one second. All right. One question I did receive, um, how to be a support system for the males in our community? How do you support slash promote getting checked? Now we know this is not the best um, favorable exam, but so how do we promote the males in our community to do this test? How do we push them forward and support them in that? 
I'll, I'll take the first stab at that. Uh, and, I, and I think that it's important that, that we uh, have uh, events like this on a more frequent basis, not necessarily that we want to overwork uh, your, your chapter, but uh, there needs to be a connection, a network, in, in this case, in the case of Hampton Roads, where there's something happening every month that, that's dealing with the awareness and education piece. Uh, once there is clear understanding of why it's so important and why timing uh, is important, timing in terms of early detection, I think as people understand that, uh, we will get greater movement. And we see a fair amount of that with, with the, the vaccination situation for COVID-19. There, there are some people who are still waiting for more proof, more evidence, uh, information that we don't really know what else they're looking for. Uh, but if we provide information as much as possible upfront and people can, can deal with the concerns and questions they have on the surface, then I think it's easier then to get more engagement, easier than to have uh, men do what we would like for them to do. And it's easier for the women in their lives. And I, I wanna really emphasize how important the women are in, in this situation. I mentioned earlier, typically women are usually responsible for meal preparation. Well, what, what the men eat uh, is extremely important. Obese men really have a difficult time with prostate cancer. They suffer and oftentimes they die. Uh, we need to just understand that much of what we eat in the black community uh, not, does not necessarily uh, uh, reflect well on our overall health. A lot of talk about disparities these days. I mean, we can deal with that by eating better, eating right and exercising. And so we need to, we need to be able to talk about that. And, 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 and I think we can achieve, uh, we can achieve greater results. I want to share something with you. I didn't know this question would come up. I'm going to read, this is a letter that I received today. Uh, and I'm going to only read a portion of this. Uh, uh, and this is from a wife who says, we wanted to give thanks to the Hampton Rose Prostate Health Forum uh, for what you do. Uh, and this is really more generous than, than it should be. We can't thank you enough uh, Charlie, we can't thank you enough for saving my husband's life when it came to his prostate cancer. We know that God continues to give you and the Hampton Roads Prostate Health Forum support and it is showing. This is what God did. We got a call from our church recently to actually serve in uh, the pulpit at our church on Father's Day and talk about uh, prostate cancer and talk about how important it is. So this issue is this is this is live. This is real. Uh, and by the way, the lady is a Delta. I mean, I'm 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 struck by that she is a Delta. I I know her well, uh, and I was surprised uh, that um, she formalized this, even though she's been saying this often. So what we need to do is have uh, people, other organizations, to model what the Suffolk Deltas are doing, uh, family members to get up to speed. Uh, and know what they're talking about. And, and then we need to just have those frank conversations with the men in our lives. And I'm talking about the husbands and the boyfriends and the sons, the brothers, the uncles. We need to have that frank conversation and basically let them know how selfish it is for them to uh, not be more engaged uh, in doing uh, what they need to do as it relates to prostate cancer. As mentioned earlier, early stage prostate cancer does not have any symptoms, particularly if it has not metastasized. So the man is not going to know he, he has prostate cancer if he does uh, by some symptoms or something, something hurts, bleed or falls off. Uh, he's not going to know that perhaps until it's too late. What he can do though, he can get in the habit of having regular and at least annual tests and exams. That is what you can do. So if you want to know what you can do, and whether you're a wife or a girlfriend, a daughter, a sister, you can encourage that these exams uh, and the exams and tests be done. And don't be fooled. 
Uh, if, if your loved one comes back to you and says, well, I'm, I, I checked out, I'm okay. You wanna ask, well, what was the PSA result? What was the blood test result? And then what was the result from the exam? It is not good enough just to have the blood test. And we know that there are some doctors who don't wanna be bothered with the, with the exam. And we know for sure that there's a lot of men who don't wanna be bothered with that. But the complementary effect of PSA tests and the exam, the digital record exam serves your loved ones best. And and Charlie, I'd like to add on to that also, please. And while we promote early detection so much is that during early detection, the first stages of prostate cancer, the tumors are residing in the prostate. Prostate cancer, uh, you know, is deadly, but it won't kill anybody if the tumors were to stay in the prostate. Uh, what, what makes prostate cancer deadly is the cancer tumors leave the prostate, they go into other vital, then they go to vital organs in your spine, then it becomes deadly. And normally, if that's the first doctor visit when prost prostate cancer has left your prostate and moved on to your spine or vital organs, the outcome is sometimes not that good. So early detection gives you a better chance of catching the prostate before the cancer, prostate cancer before the tumors leave the prostate. Thank you. Lawrence, do you have anything to add to that before she goes to the next question? You need to unmute. I wanna say that it is important that our loved ones work with us as far as that's concerned. Um, as I said, we men have egos and with our egos, we don't want to hear it or either we don't even go to the doctor, but, uh, do like my lady did me just take me by the hand. Come on, honey, we're going, and you know, we men are going and get it taken care of. I want to applaud to the ladies who do what they do to make our lives comfortable and not only just make it comfortable, make it livable. Okay. And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so our next question we have, this is from our um, Facebook chat. Is there a certain age it is more prevalent at when you receive when um, prostate cancer can be diagnosed? Is there a certain age? Well, why don't, uh, go ahead and I'll follow up, go ahead. Okay. What I wanna say about that, as far as a certain age is concerned, if you have uh, prostate cancer in your family and you're an African-American, you should start before 40 years old. Some, I've known people to about 35 years old to have actually had prostate cancer, okay? Uh, but you should at least start at 40 years old normally to have your prostate checked and your, which through your PSA and also your DRE. And if anything, uh, if it looks abnormal, um, get a, a biopsy and realize that the uh, only thing you're trying to do is to live life and enjoy life because the best is yet to come. And I want you to be here as well as your loved ones. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just weigh in on that also because um, uh, one of the things that I, I'd like to emphasize is that uh, most uh, medicine is delivered, uh, uh, certainly in this country, based on um, very well done uh, uh, evidence-based uh, research, uh, and, and, and they guide uh, a lot of the decisions that doctors and other clinicians make. Uh, the thing that we have to really, really understand is that there is very little evidence-based information on Black men. So we just have to grab that. So when you ask a question about what age, I mean, that's something you can talk with the film directors, you know, how old was this guy when he died? But if you wanna know the front end of that, what age should we be concerned about? We, we are just going along with the flow because there's not very much evidence-based information about black men. That is one reason why black men need to participate in more legitimate evidence-based studies. Now, we are delighted uh, to let you know 
that we participate in three studies, national studies. One uh, in particular I want to highlight is called uh, the response study it's based out of the University of Southern California. That, that study is a national study funded by NIH, all right? And what that study is trying to capture is the largest block of evidence-based information about black men. And, and it's, a, it's an interesting uh, study. Uh, we are the local Hampton Roads source of connections with that. There's also another national study called COMPARE. And the COMPARE study is designed to make uh, to determine if, uh, if a photon, which is what we used to call regu regular radiation, radiation, if photon radiation is better than proton radiation. And you, uh, you hear these words and just a few years ago before uh, the Hampton University uh, proton Institute open up, most people hadn't heard of proton. Uh, so the study now is, is designed to figure out, uh, and this is a national study again, figure out uh, for what cases, what circumstances is photon better than, than, than proton. We don't know the answer to a lot of this. We don't really know because we've not had the studies. Uh, we're delighted that, that we're involved with uh, uh, the, the COMPARE study. Uh, and just as recent as yesterday, um, uh, I've been representing us with the Hampton University Proton Institute as we try to figure out a way to collect information uh, from Hupti patients uh, that, uh, that, that will help answer those questions. So I, I want to emphasize that because there is no evidence-based, there's not a lot of evidence-based information about black men, uh, a lot of the questions that may appear to be, well, you ought to be able to answer that. Uh, uh, there, there is no information on which to base that other than family history, other than a very, very experienced, long uh, service doctor who has maybe had 25,000 black men as patients, he, he or she could probably uh, answer the question based on just uh, her or his uh, uh, patient load. Uh, but there are no studies that are used. Now, why is this important? This, imp this is important because the protocols that, that we follow nationally are based on the other studies that don't include enough black men. To, to make it statistically or to make them statistically important. But it's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked the question and we need, to, we need to do something about that. And I have this feeling that the, the, the Suffolk alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta is gonna lead the way at least in Hampton Roads, not just, not just Western Tidewater, but in the Hampton Roads and in addressing the education need as it relates to prostate cancer. Thank you. Yeah, that's definitely our goal with this form right here. So I do have one more question for you guys. It says, at what level is the PSA considered to be high? Oh, no, you, you got it, child? Well, I'm going to respond, okay. but go ahead. All right. Normally, your PSA reading is between a zero to a four. When it gets past four, it's, it's considered as abnormal. Um, but uh, one of the things that I have learned that the PSA reading is a standard set on a standard like Charlie was saying a few minutes ago, where a lot of us were not involved in that. Okay, so we're, we're actually working on someone else's standard. That's one of the major reasons that we appreciate so much what you Deltas are doing to get out there so that we can uh, do something about this prostate cancer and make it much better for us black men, not just here in the Tidewater area, but throughout the world, really, you are beginning of that. Uh, but uh, I've had guys who say that their PSA was over 100. And uh, I can't un couldn't understand that. But anyway, and then at times, it's not necessarily prostate cancer they have that causes that, could be something else. But uh, I want to say between zero and four is what considered the national standard. 
So, and, and let me piggyback on that. Uh, what what uh, Lawrence just gave you is the, the, the protocol based on average risk men. Average risk men are white men. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need to understand that. So when you ask the question like that, understand, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have enough evidence-based information to give you a crisply clear answer. What I can tell you is when I was diagnosed, even with the, and the protocol was zero to four, I had a less than 2.0, less than 2.0 PSA and I still was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I am aware of patients who've had PSA levels in the hundreds, as Lawrence mentioned, okay? And I've had people who've had PSA numbers that are very low and they still had prostate cancer. Yeah. So, so what, what we say to you about that question is, one, encourage your loved ones to participate in, in very well-developed studies, number one, and number two, understand why it's important for every family member uh, to engage and ask questions and learn more because it's not as easy as picking up a book and reading about, well, here's, this is what you do here, here's what you do there, etc. No, it's not for black men, okay? Uh, and, and, and you all know, I believe, that, that it's clear that uh, black men die at twice the rate of, uh, of uh, white men in terms of from prostate cancer. Now, think about this. Is that because black men are diagnosed too late? That they miss the opportunity to be treated uh, effectively? Or is it because there's something else that is functionally uh, wrong with the anatomy and physiology of a black man? You know, I want you to think about that. Why are black men dying at such a high rate compared to white men. And I think if you take a white man's diagnosis and a black man diagnosis and line them up and treat them the same way, uh, the results may surprise you. In the studies that have been done, there was very little difference in the outcome. And that ought to be revealing to you. So again, we go back to early, early detection is so important because I'm not convinced yet that, that, that uh, the situation, while it's bad because people are dying, they, they're dying unnecessarily, it may be we can solve this by having early detection of every single black man that's in our, in our community. And, and I believe that that's going to produce a result that we're going to be very proud of. Because then we'll know that early detection is the right detection. Exactly. Exactly. The, yeah, only Nicole, I like to that, the only way we're going to know that is that black men get diagnosed early, get tested annually so they can get diagnosed early and do all the things they need to do. And ladies, 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 hear me, please. We need your help. The black guys are not going to get there on their own. Okay? They're not going to get there. They're, they're going to need daughters and they're going to need mamas and they're going to need sisters and wives and girlfriends and aunties. All of y'all need to be involved if we're going to make a difference. Yes. And um, to roll into your statement on how the scales are not even between Black men and other races, there was a question asked, how does one know when a biopsy is warranted? So we know the scale is different for Black men, so should they push for it earlier, or what are your thoughts on that? A biopsy, and I know the other fellows may have something, if your doctor, who is experienced, uh, and he, he or she uh, has at least uh, had uh, maybe a several hundred patients. If your doctor and looking at all of the blood work and all of the other exams and tests that may be implemented, if your doctor concludes that you need to have a biopsy, that should be the guy. But all I'm telling you is that you can have a very high PSA and not have cancer, and you can have a very low PSA like I did and still have cancer. So if, if, if we want a clear cut answer, there is not a clear cut answer because we don't have one and that ought to scare you more than anything else. And that's the, ba the best way to deal with that is ladies, we need you to be involved and we need you to get all of your friends involved because this is, a, this is murky water 
and you're not going to solve this. We're not going to solve this unless we have every single black man who cares about himself and the people who love him, have them do what they're supposed to do at least annually and ask questions about what the results suggest. Those questions are typically will be about the PSA and the exams uh, and obesity uh, and other physiological issues. So that's why the, the ladies need to be involved. And Charlie, I'd like to add on to that because at a certain time when you're monitoring your PSA levels and getting your, your blood work done, when you see an uh, increase in the velocity of, of the numbers going up, it's, it's time to switch over from your primary care and see a urologist. A urologist is trained specifically uh, to answer those questions about um, what type of testing you need. And I think more people need to understand that um, a urologist is who is the doctor that's trained to handle prostate cancer. Your primary care need to switch you over or you need to ask, say, I think it's time based on my numbers going up that I need to make an appointment and see a, a urologist. Thank you. Oh, Charlie, what, uh, and one should not be afraid to ask the doctor that what kind of experience have they had in this? Uh, how many patients have they done? Uh, with situations like this, especially black men, okay? And as uh, Everett said, uh, direct me to, uh, 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 as I would say, a higher power or a urologist, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so that we can actually get to the cause. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank Hello. you um, all for the answers to that question. I did wanna give you guys one more last time, we're gonna wrap it on up, to provide all the information that you have on this side for the Hampton Roads Prostate Health Forum. We, we lost you, uh, would you read We lost, that? yes. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we want to conclude the question section, but I wanted to give you a chance, Mr. Hill, Mr. Davis, and Mr. Browning, to share the information for the Hampton Roads Prostate Health Forum, the number, contact, and website, if you all could um, provide that to our viewers. Absolutely. Well, the, the, we have a number that's the, our prostate number is area code 757-827-0488. And we, we ask, we beg whoever calls to, to give us information uh, like your full name and a number that we can uh, call you back at. Uh, we get a lot of calls where somebody is using a friend's phone and we call the number and they don't know anything about it. So if you can give us your name, uh, the subject that you're calling about and the telephone number, we return 100% of the calls. So that's probably the easiest thing. Uh, our website is www.hrprostatehealth.com. That's again, www.hrprostatehealth.com. Dot com And going to that, there's another vehicle for getting it to us electronically. But, but I prefer talking to, to men uh, because then I can get a sense of feel for what's really mm -hmm. going on. And, and I prefer that the ladies in the lives of those men uh, be, be part of that experience because I just have convinced that we're not gonna work our way out of this prostate cancer issue as it relates to black men without women uh, in, in our lives who are equally or maybe even more interested than, than the men are. Thank you all again for your input. Now that concludes our question portion for our last installment of our Black Health series. I would like to thank all our viewers who took the time to join us this weekend and receive the knowledge provided on this topic that is so important to not only the males in our community, but to the families as well. Once again, I would like to remind you if you have any further questions, please forward them to us at suffolkdst.org or at the information provided by Mr. Charlie Hill. We will make sure all questions are provided to the presenters. To our prostate warriors, Mr. Charlie Hill, Mr. Lawrence, the bell ringer Davis, and Mr. Everett Browning. <laughs> Thank you so much today Best for your to come. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
so much for your time and education on the topic and being great resources to the Hampton Roads community through the Prostate Health Forum. You all are both, you all are such strong pillars in the community and this information is vital. On behalf of Suffolk Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, thank you again. Thank to you. our viewers, please feel free to you. all social media platforms. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank have, you. Have a great Thank day. You. Bye. The best is yet to come. Yeah, it is. <laughs>